Well, welcome Mark Struby from the um, Rock Island Arsenal Army Sustainment Command. He's going to be talking about rearm tonight, the second to last presentation in this year's Rock Island Arsenal 160th anniversary series. And welcome. Yay. All right. So we're, we'll jump right into it here. So um, there's a lot of differences in what people think of when they think of the history of the Rock Island Arsenal. Um, we've talked about uh, World War One, World War Two. We've talked a little bit about the Spanish American War, of course, everything that led up to it. Uh, but now we're getting a little bit more in the weeds with rearm and uh, rearm. Rearm is a really great bedtime story to read to your child when you're very upset at them. Um, but uh, but we're, we're gonna we're gonna go through this slog just a little bit here. Uh, so we have our modern presentation, which is what we have up on screen. But I also have an original rearm presentation from nine April nineteen eighty one. Uh, that has actually helped me a little bit here. Uh, and a few of those slides are in this presentation uh, this evening as well. Uh, same thing as always, anybody who's watching these wonderful videos uh, is that um, Rock Island Arsenal remains open for anybody who wants to actually come and visit. Please do that. Uh, please do that. They're yelling at us. Please make the yelling stop. Um, so you can actually scan that barcode there and you can do a virtual tour of the arsenal or you can actually come to the arsenal proper. It takes about 10, 15 minutes to get a, uh, get a visitor pass and then you are on your way uh, to over 200 years worth of history at Rock Island Arsenal. So with that, let's dive right on in to rearm just a little bit here. Um, and rearm, oh, yeah, this is, uh, this is one of those big topics that uh, you know they, they talk to us about in an official capacity, and then you have to convert it for public consumption. Uh, but rearm, as it was defined, is the renovation of armament manufacturing. Rearm, and it is the Army's program for modernizing the production capabilities at Rock Island Arsenal uh, for peacetime mobilization and emergency production. Uh, and to kind of put that into perspective, it's basically the production capabilities at Rock Island Arsenal, period, uh, because you have peacetime operations, so when there's no war, mobilization when there's active war, and emergency production such as 9-11-esque kind of uh, buildups. So that's the, that's the gist of uh, the mission statement. But the thing to remember about rearm is that it's not even a Rock Island Arsenal initiative. Was not a Rock Island Arsenal initiative. Uh, it actually came to us in the late 1970s from Waterfleet Arsenal, uh, where there was another rearm program that was in progress. And eventually, uh, we have these wonderful things in the Army called Good Idea Fairies. Good Idea Fairies are generally very bad things, they're very stupid things. Uh, however, uh, rearm was not one of those kinds of good idea fairies. Rearm was a very positive good idea fairy that was just poorly communicated uh, at all levels. And we'll see an example of that here uh, as we go into the presentation just a little bit further. Uh, but generally speaking, the study looked at Rock Island Arsenal's wartime production and surge habits uh, versus its capabilities. So what did we do during World War I? What did we do during World War II and Korea and Vietnam and things like that? So what were these situations like versus how do we see a trend? It's the positive trend is a negative trend. Um, so needless to say, anybody who's aware of statistics probably hears that and is just like, oh God, I've had enough statistics in my life. I don't need more. Unfortunately, that's pretty much all that Rearm was, was the generation of a bunch of statistics. Make it look bad shortly, too. Don't worry, I'll get your numbers in there for all you mathematicians. Math is not my friend because I'm a historian. Uh, it also examined all the missions anticipated uh, at the arsenal uh, and eventually will get us through the 1985 to 2000 period. Basically, it's the expansion to meet the floor space that matched with the needs of the arsenal during the Cold War. So one of the things that you'll notice, and actually I'll go ahead and point out right away, is that during the Korean War and the Vietnam War, 
there were no major construction projects at Rock Island uh, This is very different, of course, from Spanish American War, World War I, World War II. You don't see the same kind of expansion during uh, the Cold, any of the Cold War, except for rearm and a few other small projects here and there. I don't want to say that there weren't any, but there weren't any of quite the grand scale. Now, the picture at the bottom is the rearm building. It's building 212, just a couple a year or so maybe after it was completed. A great government looking building. It's all beautiful and gray and gray. And there's some gray over here and some gray over there too. And there's even a little bit of white to give you a little bit of hope in there somewhere. Uh, but yes, it's a very government looking building. Uh, but one of the things too, uh, that I want to make sure that I emphasize here at the beginning is that rearm was a notion of uh, there's a broken process and that process needs to be fixed. I'm going to go ahead and just put a trigger warning out there now that if anybody has OCD, there's one slide coming up that is extremely terrible. It's a terrible slide to look at uh, and it will trigger all of your OCD things because there's just wires and lines and arrows pointing everywhere in all these different directions. And um, it's very much like the Always Sunny in Philadelphia meme where the guy has got the cork board up, he's got all these pictures and newspaper clippings and there's yarn all across uh, the board. Well, that's what we have here later. So we'll dive into it. But first, understand rearm. You gotta understand where we came from. Uh, so as we ended the last presentation, we were talking about World Wars I and II. So after the drawdown in World War II, we cut the workforce by about 90% in as little as about a year after the war ends. So it's a big uh, cut to the workforce. Uh, but there were renovations that were carried out. Um, I don't want to, uh, to, to sell that short. However, uh, one of the big things, we'll see it here on a later slide, this is some of the data that we pulled out of our 1981 presentation is that uh, this is very important that there were renovations carried out at this time because these are the renovations that the Rock Island Arsenal is using in Vietnam. Uh, most of the machinery and most of the modernizations and updates and everything are the same ones that were installed during the post-World War II era. Some of them were post-Korea, uh, but many of them actually happened right here. Uh, there were shop modernizations that happened just a little bit. There weren't too many. But one of the big things, too, that I want to make sure gets pointed out is that the apprenticeship schools are maintained and expanded. We learned the lesson from World War I into World War II that we need to not cut our apprenticeship programs. Uh, so we don't see those get cut uh, as we go into Vietnam and again as we go, or excuse me, as we go into Korea and then again as we go into Vietnam, those don't get cut uh, like they were threatened with in uh, World War I. But the uh, arsenal was basically designed to, uh, at this time, to meet a need if there was one. There were a few spin-up orders here and there from 1947 to uh, early 1950, and most of those spin-up orders were pretty much uh, fielded by a group of contractors that would come in and help with the material procurement and um, get everything spun up like that. But by and large, uh, it was a very quiet time at the Arsenal. There was not there was not a lot going on. I won't say there was nothing going on, but there was not a lot going on during this time until we get into Korea. So as we get into Korea here, uh, this that you have on screen here, this is actually the uh, ordinance uh, mission set for uh, Rock Island Arsenal by and large. And as you can see, once we get into the Korean War, there's an awful lot of missions uh, that the Rock Island Arsenal is handling. Some of them are even from start to finish. Uh, so we'll have uh, 4.2 inch mortars that Rock Island Arsenal is uh, handling start to finish. Sky sweepers uh, and aircraft guns are being uh, handled by the Rock Island Arsenal from start to finish. So generally speaking, just a lot of things that are going on and are being produced at the arsenal. Uh, however, we generally don't talk too much about any of these. Um, we've got recoil mechanisms, same thing that we've been doing since World War II or World War I. We've got carriages, same thing we've been doing since World War I. Mortars, same thing. Rocket launchers uh, between Redstone Arsenal and us. Uh, we are also involved in that as well motor rammers, things like that, and even machine guns and the refurbishment of rifles. Uh, but a lot of these are old hat kind of for Rock Island by this point. Um, we, we're good at it, uh, but they're not really uh, innovative in any sort of a way. Um, so something to kind of put up here is these are 
generally the unchanged missions from uh, World War II to Korea. But as all that being said is that the arsenal remained one of the, the most readily available and readily ready to mobilize installations that existed anywhere. So this left RIA to carry many more of those ordnance missions, a lot of them from R&D to manufacture. And then eventually we'll see some transitions towards the end of the Korean War, we'll start to see what's called the commodity. Um, so a lot of times when we hear about Rock Island Arsenal, when we've been talking about history entirely in all of our talks up to this point, we've been talking about Rock Island Arsenal as the whole, but then we change in about 1955, we're talking about Rock Island Arsenal as a whole to Rock Island Arsenal, the factory versus Rock Island Arsenal, the command. Uh, so we start to see these uh, commodity commands and an example of these Ordnance Weapons Command, uh, which is actually at Rock Island Arsenal in 1955. These commodity commands, I'm not gonna get too down in the weeds now because we'll be talking about them next time, but these commodity commands are basically in charge of fielding that material and overseeing the production from start to finish. And Ordnance Weapons Command will actually have a lot of the research and development missions. Uh, shipments of material will leave Rock Island Arsenal directly and make it right to the warfighter over in Korea. But this was especially true with the Super Bazooka. And the Super Bazooka is that kind of refreshing jolt uh, of sorts for the Rock Island Arsenal. So as I mentioned, you know, some of these missions were old pet, the Super Bazooka was not one of these. Uh, the Super Bazooka was actually an extremely significant uh, and game-changing weapon system. So a bit of a background on that. We have World War II, we'll see the Bazooka come into play. Uh, bazookas get captured in large quantities by the Germans, who will then reverse engineer them and upgrade them and then just use the, their upgraded bazookas against the Americans by and large, which is always a disaster. But after paperclip happens, Americans capture the rest of these weapon systems. They'll bring them back here and then they'll reverse engineer them here. And the Rock Island Arsenal is actually gonna be in charge of uh, researching ways to make them even a little bit better still. So when you see the M20 Super Bazooka, it's close, more closely related to its German counterpart uh, than the American, but these, uh, the Super Bazooka, the M19 and the M20s were actually designed to breach thicker armor. So they were great uh, going against tanks. So they were the Korean version of the Javelin uh, weapon system. Uh, it also had an extended range uh, in addition to a higher um, yield uh, explosive charge that it was actually married with but they were able to keep it about the same weight, which is about 13 or 14 pounds. So it was a very durable, very portable system. Uh, it wasn't something that was, uh, it, it wasn't something that was super duper heavy, as you can see in the picture, uh, soldier carrying a split uh, super bazooka here. Uh, there was actually two pieces. So he's not carrying two, he's be carrying one along with a round, uh, but they were very portable for this reason. And these actually did change the course of the Korean War by and large for warfighters. And most of the super bazookas that were produced here at Rock Island Arsenal were shipped right from Rock Island Arsenal to Korea. There wasn't a stopover in a federal stockyard or a depot or anything. They went right to the warfighter, uh, unlike a lot of other things. Uh, during the interwar period, we started to see a little bit more RDE, research and development and engineering happening, happening at Rock Island. Uh, you'll start to see systems such as the XM70 and the XM50. Uh, that it is actually a picture of the only XM70 that is left in the world back there. It is at Memorial Field at Rock Island Arsenal. That's the B2 variant. Um, Rock Island was charged with creating mobile uh, weapon system carriers, actually. And this, this is something that they, they hold on to dearly for quite some time. It's very kind of strange because uh, it starts with uh, the MGR-3 Little John rocket system, they, making it a, a sling portable version of the trailer where they can actually carry the carriage, uh, carry the launch, carry the rocket by helicopter. Well, eventually this transitions into ordnance systems such as uh, howitzers and field guns. And they just, uh, they are obsessed with this tactic. And we'll talk about that here shortly too. Uh, but you'll start to see a lot of uh, things like that. So 
you ever see a little John rocket and it has the short and stubby box wings, uh, that is actually the upgraded MGR-3, and that is the weapon system that the Rock Island Arsenal was working on the update carriage for. You see them with the triangle fins. Uh, we weren't quite as involved in that uh, as we were for the other one. Uh, I believe the other one was the XM-318 um, rocket system. So we weren't too terribly involved in that. Uh, but my, fan fi my favorite goes to... Uh, the big guns, of course, that Rock Island produced, and those included the High Altitude Research Project guns, or HARP project, um, or Project HARP, excuse me. Uh, so they actually worked with Waterfleet Arsenal to create and fabricate gun tubes and then marry them to the system. Uh, some of these were seven to 15 inch guns. They were just absolutely massive monsters of design. And the whole point of these guns was to actually shoot rounds up words of 100,000 feet in the air, and then test ballistics of the projectile as it came back down to Earth. Uh, of all the harp guns that existed, there's one left that looks nice, and the other one is in Barbados, and it looks like trash. Uh, but the one that exists that still looks like something uh, pretty, uh, it exists down at Yuma Probing Ground in Arizona. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go down there, it's a 15-inch harp gun. It's hanging out down there. It's got ARL on the side still, and a big AMC crest on it. Uh, it's it's actually a really, really cool looking, looking system. Uh, the XM70 that's displayed back there, it's a really interesting concept. And that is that it is a rotary firing rocket launcher. So once we come out of World Wars one and two, where we have the honeycomb looking rocket launchers, where there's like 18 tubes and it's all a battery along the back that pretty much fires using a charge of electricity. Well, the XM70 does not do that. Instead of what, instead of that, what it does is it takes the concept of a portable howitzer system, uh, and it actually uses an elongated tube, as you can see there. And then there's actually a rotary mechanism in back. By doing this, you reduce the amount of slope that is actually coming off the system. So, if, for example, you aren't able to land your target, you aren't you know, holding a big red sign that says, here's all the smoke, shoot here uh, anymore because uh, you've reduced your visibility to the enemy by using this system. Uh, this doesn't get fielded, however. We start to see things like um, MRLDS systems, so medium range uh, rocket launcher uh, platforms. So uh, by the time we actually kind of perfect this, it's already kind of obsolete. We're moving on to something else. So. That's why there weren't too many of these made, but it was a really ingenious design at the time too, uh, to get that rotary system that way. Um, jumping back here, this is one of my one of my favorite drawings. So this is actually a picture of a 203 millimeter howitzer that's married to what is called the triple threat carriage or the triple threat gun. Um, if anybody's familiar with the atomic cannon or atomic purple version of the atomic anti-carriage. So if you are familiar with nomenclature, I promise I'll get you, I'll get you to a point where you understand this. That is the T-72 E1 carriage. This is the T-76 E1 carriage, and there's also a T-76 E2 carriage. Um, but both of those 76 models were designed to be more portable versions of the large uh, anti-carriage that uh, everybody's, many people, is very familiar with. Problem with the anti carriage is that it took two prime movers, two semis to move. It was a honking thing to move. It was actually based on railway artillery. Uh, so the triple thread carriage here uh, actually was designed to be moved by one prime mover, quickly in place, and then quickly moved if necessary. And if you needed, you could actually swap out the gun tubes. So it could have a 203, a 175, or a 155 millimeter gun on it. Didn't matter. Uh, Rock Island did help with research and development on the triple threat uh, carriage. It didn't do, you know, a whole heck of a lot. It, most, of, most of its activities were limited to uh, working with the recoil mechanisms and the hydraulic systems on these weapons. Uh, however, their involvement continued a legacy that actually followed them from World War II, uh, and that is their involvement with atomic deployment systems. Uh, so during World War II, 
Manhattan Project was operating and Rock Island Arsenal was actually involved in Manhattan Project in that they made the Fat Man bomb casings from 1943 to 1947. Just the casings, mind you. Uh, and this kind of carries that over in that they are continuing to work with the uh, atomic deployable devices, such as the carriage and the gun system. Then we get to the Vietnam War. Uh, Vietnam War, where there, there's a big problem with Vietnam uh, when it comes to uh, deploying a force, and that is you're deploying a force to the jungle, and ordnance systems are heavy. And one of the problems that you have is if you are in jungle and you have a very heavy ordnance system and you fire it, it tends to sink in mud. And we had a lot of problems with this. Um, so this is a problem that needs to be solved, but we also had the ONTOS, the XM50, or as it was called then, the M50, uh, being produced for the Marines. But the problem with the M50 is that it had six 106 millimeter recoilless rifles on it. The problem with this is that you could only load them if you got outside the armor itself. So if you did not light up your target and end your enemy, pretty much, um, you better run. Uh, and just take the loss because you you are not going to have any success really getting back out and reloading all six rounds uh because the enemy knows exactly where you are by now if they haven't figured it out before and they're they're going to be looking for this weird looking thing which ontos actually means the thing um they're going to be looking for this thing that that lit them up and failed uh however uh rock island arsenal was able to solve some of these problems uh, particularly the sinking into the mud. So this is actually an artistic concept of an air mobile uh, firing platform, which we did actually produce a number of these platforms and they basically prevented the sinking of um, field guns and howitzers. So. That's cool. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the other thing too that I wanna point out on this is you'll notice a very odd looking trail to that howitzer. Um, and the reason that it's, uh, it's kind of unique is it uses a wishbone design. This wishbone design was designed to make things more lightweight, so the carriage was easier to tow. Uh, it was able to have the howitzer actually brought in by helicopter. Again, I told you they were fascinated with using helicopters. Um, the Army was very fascinated in using helicopters. Uh, but it also enhanced uh, the stability of the ordnance system. It helped with recoil. It helped with making sure that uh, you didn't have an out of battery firing cycle. So it, it helped with quite a bit. And you'll see these on the M102s and the XM123 howitzers in particular. Uh, but eventually we'll get into the split trail um, XM198s by the time we get to the end of the Vietnam War. And by the time we get to that, we've, we've gotten to a point to where um, we're a little bit more focused on uh, getting accurate rounds of fire. Something else that the Rock Island Arsenal was doing was working on Jeeps and combat cars. Once again, combat cars coming back into the picture. Uh, but what I thought was really interesting is that uh, we had the mission of converting Jeeps to ambulances in Vietnam. And it's also a mission that we still have today is converting Humvees to ambulances. But some of the other things that we were also doing are uh, mounting 106 millimeter recoilless guns onto these Jeeps uh, that were manufactured by the Ford Motor, Motor Company mm -hmm. uh, and then sent here to be converted. So some of those numbers there, 3,000 Jeeps were converted to carry the 106 millimeter recoilless rifle. Uh, about 1,000 Jeeps were modified to function as an ambulance. The peak employment at the arsenal was around 5,200. Um, by the time we get the 1972, and then we get the drawdown or ends, you know, 72 to 75, uh, but it doesn't uh, exceed uh, 5,200. M102 howitzers, by and large, received a lot of repair and upgrades. So the jungle was just chewing the hell out of uh, ordnance systems that the Army was fielding. So the arsenal was making a lot of spare parts at this time. Uh, but something else that was going on is that uh, we had the Ramsey tank test track built, uh, and this replaced the old Kingsbury 
uh, test track, which is the picture where we see all the combat cars from World War I, World War II. That goes away during Vietnam uh, and it's replaced by the Ramsey test track. Unfortunately, I didn't put it in here, but we do have a really cool uh, picture. It's just not high enough resolution of an M60 actually rolling through the opening ribbon for the tank test track. Uh, and the ribbon is being held by two other tanks and the tank is just barreling through the ribbon. Uh, but that is one of the big, um, really kind of the biggest change that happens uh, as far as layout of the island itself is that Ramsey test track gets open. There's also maintenance shacks that are uh, being built and up armored. So if there's any kind of communications uh, systems, they get housed in the maintenance shacks. And modifications for the shared in defense systems. Uh, so uh, anything that had to do with the uh, the defensive mechanisms in the, in the shared in weapon system. So uh, lots of artillery shells going in and out there. Uh, 673 manufactured uh, in that configuration and 2,500 retroactive kits built uh, to actually update those systems. And then of course, by the end of the war, Rock Island Arsenal does begin work on the XM198, which becomes a staple product from about 1974, five, all the way up through about 1993. And it would not be fair to talk about Rock Island Arsenal at this time without talking a little bit about the weapons lab. We'll be talking about more about it next time. Uh, but there was a weapons lab on Rock Island Arsenal that was under the purview of Weapons Command or WECOM which was formerly Ordnance Weapons Command. You'll have to follow along with that one at home. If, you, if you're not here in person, you're gonna get lost uh, on that next talk, folks. Um, but WECOM was responsible for a lot of the R&D of uh, experimental programs. So the uh, XM-70, that was, that was uh, part of their whole um, operational footprint. The XM-16, which eventually becomes the M-16 and the M-4, that comes out of um, out of WECOM. But um, in addition to that, though, here's where that fascination comes to fruition. So this picture back here is of a, a 105 millimeter howitzer that this uh, this fantastic soldier is going to fire off the side of a uh, CH-53 helicopter. And um, I, I'll just tell you, that's not a good idea. Uh, if you know anything about how recoil works, that's a terrible idea, in fact. Uh, but there's, there's a few instances where we've seen them attempt to try this off of a CH-53, also a CH-47, a Chinook, uh, and an H-21. So they're very interested in trying to uh, lay down artillery from highly mobile uh, situations. So the idea here is that you would have this loaded on to the side of a helicopter, be able to land quickly in place, fire, then get back in the helicopter and move again. You can move a lot faster in a helicopter than 50 guys on the ground can move while they're being shot at by uh, Vietnamese soldiers. So that's the idea here for why they're trying to perfect this. Some of the weapons, however, uh, were very out there. Uh, and some of them used rounds such as flechettes, which are basically uh, dark looking projectiles that have no gunpowder or explosive in them. And we have a few documents that are looking into the feasibility of using flechettes in outer space, for example. So there was that kind of research was happening there. Uh, and even a few of these systems were actually designed that could use flechettes. A couple of those are at the Rock Island Arts Museum. Uh, and I believe that they are still there. I, I, I don't think those went anywhere. Um, but another few different sets of the artillery systems and experimental systems that they had there, uh, besides the XM-70 and the XM-123, the M2 Terrastar, which actually had three uh, tri-wheels that actually ran uh, across the ground. So basically, if you got stuck somewhere, one of the wheels would flop up, and then you would be able to move on your merry way. Two of those got produced. Uh, I know that one of them lives at Rock Island. Whether or not the other one is still alive anywhere, I don't know, but that system did not, of course, get to deal with. So that's all that was going on at Rock Island Arsenal pre Rio. Now, this is the slide where, if you have OCD at all, 
or if you are afraid of arrows and lines on uh, on screens, I, I encourage you to look away. So this is a map of Rock Island Arsenal uh, pre rio and uh, what you're going to notice here when I put this into motion is that there's going to be arrows that are going to show up on screen. And these arrows are actually going to show you the route of a typical piece of material, a typical item, not even a complete system. This is just a typical item for a manufacturer at the arsenal. This is the route that it would take. Yes. Uh, mapped out, this equates to about 2.4 miles worth of movement. Uh, and it includes a large number of buildings. It's not a very efficient process by any means. Uh, it's also not a very safe process or a secure process by any means, especially depending on what it is that you're working with. Uh, but this is one of the key things uh, that the Ordnance Department wants to take care of and resolve when they're looking at rearm. So, and this, uh, this white box up here to the side, this is the actual map that is in the original briefing mm -hmm. from 1981 that shows the exact same process. Um, it's just maybe a little bit more clean looking, uh, but even when you clean it up, it's still not a great looking, uh, great looking map. So there was a little bit more to it as well, besides all that, the condition of buildings. Uh, so what we have up top here, I'm actually going to cheat. I'm going to I'm going to break out this. So the top picture there is the plating shop roof. Uh, the second picture is machine shop, and the uh, third one, if I remember right, is the uh, actual exterior of building two fifty. So it's a it's a mostly glass building uh, that we had. Uh, during World War One, that's where all the ammunition shells were actually filled. But if you look at them, you can actually see the condition. So we have a really nasty looking roof, uh, dilapidating, uh, dilapidated facade uh, and problems with the windows and uh, stone features on the sides of buildings that are falling apart. Uh, so all not very safe things by any means uh, and something that you definitely would wanna fix. Something else that's mentioned up there is the uh, industrial plant equipment and acquisition profile, which is a very fancy way of saying, this is when we bought our stuff. Uh, and if you actually look at that graph, it actually will show you that when we bought most of our stuff was in World War II and Korea. And then of course the graph on the side, of course, I don't know why I said of course, but, but the graph on the, uh, on the side there is actually talking about how much it's costing uh, to actually replace all the equipment and the amount of loss generated because of how long it's taken to replace equipment at the Rock Island Arsenal and that there is a deficit versus the actual GDP growth. So it's, it's actually a very precarious uh, situation that Rearm is looking at and trying to fix at this time, um, all the while dealing with things like old equipment, as mentioned here, cost, dilapidation of buildings, so we've got safety and environmental issues, as well as the movement of stuff from one point to another. But unfortunately, uh, when you have a lot of stuff that you're trying to fix, and it's a military installation, sometimes public communication is not very good. Uh, and indeed, and I'm sure there's probably at least a couple of documents on this in special collections, is Project Disarm. Uh, and this is, uh, was in a movement in the area, an actual movement in the area that was aimed at shutting down Rock Island Arsenal. There were numerous protests in the area. Uh, some of them got rather heated, but the concept, the understanding from these individuals is um, that the spending at Rock Island Arsenal is for more weapons, more power, more weapons, more power, war, 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 more weapons, more power, uh, military industrial complex. And indeed, you have to remember the time that we're in. This is 1981. We had just wrapped up with a disaster in Vietnam, uh, and people are very much looking for, for people to blame. 
So that's what we have uh, with Project Disarm. Now, Disarm is misinformed. They're not necessarily wrong. They are misinformed with the information that they have available to them. Where the communication breakdown was, I couldn't tell you where that is. Um, so for example here, um, the implication here is that Rock Island Arsenal is uh, involved in germ warfare in some way. No. Uh, the implication is that Rock Island Arsenal is somehow involved in nuclear warfare. No. Uh, the implication that uh, there, all this money is being used just for the production of uh, howitzers and guns. No. In fact, there is actually a line in this pamphlet that is displayed up here that is talking about Rock Island Arsenal's production of ammunition and guns, neither of which the Rock Island Arsenal had produced at this time for over 30 years. Uh, and if you want to talk about ammunition, they hadn't produced it for over 60 years. Now, the reason that I have all this up here is there is actually a white box that's hard to see on the screen because of the fact that it's a white box and a white background. But you will see next to the hungry eat your 105 millimeter howitzer, it says related activities. And the related activities are actually out of the 1981 briefing, and that is the actual mission set of reading. We'll read them here environmental, energy, safety, historical preservation, security, and communications. So breaking it down, these are anti-war protesters and anti-military protesters who are also probably also pro-Earth, very much into clean energy initiatives, very much into safety. Don't know necessarily about historic preservation or anything like that, but this, these are the things that they're into and they are protesting environmental progress energy efficiency and safety procedures. Whether they knew this or not is a matter of contention. I don't have an answer for that, but this is what it ultimately comes down to is these are the intentions. And we'll take a look at some of those here in a moment. But for all the mess that rearm was before, uh, after rearm comes through, and you can see this is the post rearm map here, uh, the process is a little better. So the red is the new construction. The blue arrows are still the pro is still the process of um, of moving material around, and the yellow boxes are buildings that have been removed from the process post rearm. Uh, so you'll see that there's actually been a condensing of uh, movement of material uh, and manufacturing process by including the rearm buildings. And this is again, this is just showing that map uh, as it was shown in the 1981 briefing uh, up here as well. Again, the, the maps up there aren't super duper great. It's really hard to make a map about this is where things move exciting. Um, it's actually really hard to make rearm exciting. It's a struggling process. <laughs> So using state-of-the-art technology in 1981, they took this fantastic photo. Uh, this is the aerial photo of 1979. And we futurized this state-of-the-art white building. Photoshop before it was Photoshop, y'all. Uh, onto the back, again, it's a very sexy government white gray building. <laughs> you know, it's just... I'm sorry, we don't we don't make interesting looking architecture. Anyway, so rearm was rolled out in multiple phases between 1981 and 1985. By the time we get to 1989, construction is done. By the time we get to 1992, the committee is dissolved uh, as intended. So the first thing that comes first is tearing down the old machine center. Uh, so removing that. Uh, finally, we build the new manufacturing addition. So uh, to kind of give you some idea here, the old machining building is approximately in the center of, uh, of that photo. That's where it was originally located. New parking lot because people have to come to work. I know that's exciting. Uh, three main buildings that were decaying. So the uh, three that I had showed you pictures of, those are rehabilitated. Then the stone shops are rehabilitated. 
Um, and then additions come to the forge, updates the machinery and things like that. And then you finally get renovations of the stone shops for office space, which one of the important things to note is that the renovations that come to the stone shops are something that we're still kind of seeing the benefits of today because we have army contract land that's in one of those buildings. Central uh, Human Resources Agency for the North Central Region, all of DOD is in one of those buildings. And First Army is in one of those buildings. So um, it's really kind of important that we got that taken care of. Uh, there were also updates performed to infrastructure, so things like the hydroelectric power dam, uh, sewer, heating, communications. There is actually a citation in one of the annual histories post rearm that cited that this whole complex, the cost of heating in this whole complex, uh, was the efficiency increased by 327% uh, in one year of heating. Uh, so in other words, they were able to keep three square feet for every one square foot of the old building. So it, there, there was a lot of efficiency that went into that. The Gulf War was kind of the first uh, kind of run at, uh, at what the rearm process was going to be. Uh, and most of that was up armoring pieces of equipment and repair, but we also still had uh, the M198 and we also had the M119, which was the American version of the British L119 gun. Uh, but we were producing these and making repairs and getting spare parts out and even upgrading some of the M198s and exporting some of the M198s as well uh, at this time. So there was, there was still that mission going on. Uh, but generally speaking, there was a lot of ease in this transition. Um, most of the rearm operations were actually conducted in a way that they didn't interrupt uh, any of the industrial process at Rock Island. But in general, uh, most of these uh, processes work to actually make sure that uh, the needs of the warfighter that was fighting in Kuwait and Iraq at the time, those needs were met. But something that I want to put out here, uh, and this is actually something that contributes to the larger of Rock Island Arsenal as is today, not necessarily as it was. Uh, AMCCOM, uh, so the Armament Munitions and Chemical Command was headquartered at Rock Island Arsenal and it's one that has grown, that grew out of Weapons Command and Ordnance Weapons Command. Uh, but it was coordinating all the logistical movement of material in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, uh, as well as building research and development and overseeing kind of the depot activity that was happening back uh, in the States. But all the lessons that were learned from the Gulf War eventually will be used in the Global War on Terror, uh, GWAT, uh, and those will get passed down to the Operations Support Command, or OSC, uh, once that comes around. And then, of course, in the later years of that, we'll start to see Tank and Automotive Command, uh, TACOM, which now runs the factory, will grow out of that. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit about that uh, on the next talk. Laying this out though, uh, this is actually, uh, both of those on the side are uh, from the 1981 briefing. The save 183 for each $1 invested, that turned out to be false. They actually saved $2.68 for every dollar spent. Uh, according to, uh, to the 1989 annual history that was submitted for the Rock Island Arsenal. So they actually exceeded rejections. Environmental, uh, what they took care of with all these related activities here. So environmental, they were helping out by reducing the amount of energy expended to move materials. So that helped with energy, reduce the amount of time and cost to build materials. So there's efficiency going into that as well. Uh, reduced emissions from outdated machinery and overtaxed energy grids, as well as replaced machinery that had tons and tons and tons and tons, and tons of lead in it. Uh, so that's an environmental and a safety matter there. Historical preservation by preserving some of the buildings and actually bringing them up to speed because none of the new machinery weighed anywhere as little as the machinery that was in there before. Mm -hmm. It just would not have been possible to have the new machinery in there. Security, because you have reduced the amount of movement of material uh, outdoors, you've increased the amount of security and communication by increasing uh, having everything done in-house like that. Uh, you've increased the communication as well. Uh, but something else, too, that I want to point out is increased work competitiveness, job security for the local community. The Rock Island Arsenal has to compete 
within DOD for its own work. Uh, that means that even if, for example, uh, the Army owns Rock Island Arsenal and they need a new weapon system, well, the Arsenal has to bid against companies like Reef. Uh, they can't just go in and be just like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the Army. I can just go and make this in-house. No, they actually have to compete with Raytheon to build that system. Uh, so by doing this, they have reduced the cost of labor, they've reduced the cost of maintenance, and they've reduced their overhead costs, which makes them more competitive. And more competitive uh, in this area means higher gross domestic product, which also means more jobs, more community spending, better for local economy. Uh, so there's a number of different reasons why uh, you would want rearm to go well, but uh, something else to kind of point out here too, um, expansion of the office spaces. Uh, so I mentioned ACC, First Army and Chara, but we also have Army Community Services that are in those buildings. Uh, we have Installation and Management Command, and we also had Fifth Army for a period of time running around up here. So there were a lot of uh, agencies that went through these buildings. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it was very important for them to uh, get these buildings kind of put up to date. Uh, I think of all the buildings, it's probably building 68 and building 66, which is First Army and the gym that got the most updates because that's where most of the machine was still, uh, as well as building 66 and 106. Uh, those both got, um, or no, excuse me, 64 and 106. Uh, those both got gutted out really good. Uh, unfortunately, 106 is still kind of nasty. And actually, really, so is building 64. I wouldn't recommend going to any one of those. So, uh, but since rearm, uh, RAA continued production operations and efficiency. So basically, we do continue to make changes to the efficiency of mission operations uh, today, even. Uh, they're just not quite on the grand of scale as rearm was. Uh, but we do still periodically have things come in for M198s, although by and large, the M198s have been replaced with the M777s. Uh, M119 field guns. The main thing that they're working on right now, uh, as far as big pieces, is the XM35. Uh, that will eventually go to production at some point. Uh, but in addition to that, as I mentioned before, we still do have the program for up armoring uh, Humvees to ambulances. That's something that we've carried apparently since Vietnam. Uh, up armoring of vehicles, which was something that we were doing a lot of at the beginning of GY. Uh, we actually have one of those pieces at the museum. It is a huge honking piece of metal. I've never seen that metal in windows this thick before. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, but uh, they will do repairs to numerous systems across the UE too. So it's not just the Army. There's Air Force contracts. There's Navy contracts. Uh, all that comes into Rock Island uh, Arsenal in the factory side. So... Um, the other thing, though, and I think this is kind of sad, is most of the research and development missions have left Rock Island. Uh, every now and then you'll see new methods show up in the machining uh, sector, but the capacity remains, but by and large, there's not a whole heck of a lot of that going on. Uh, but as far as the end of the history of the factory side, this brings you up to relatively current state with the factory side of the island. As I mentioned towards the beginning of this, Rock Island Arsenal's history splits, uh, has a dual personality that kind of splits after World War II. Because uh, the next time we're going to talk about the Commodities Commands uh, and all of their activities at Rock Island. And that kind of has shaped what Rock Island Arsenal has become today. And it's been this very strange thing that I don't think very many people have really understood. So we'll talk about that next time with Army Materiel Command at Rock Island Arsenal. Yay. Thank you for everyone who joined us online and thank you for those of who that joined us in person. Um, we'll upload this to YouTube and thank you so much for joining us tonight.